I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I see the Ten Commandments and how, I, and how it relates to what we're going to talk about this morning. Uh, I played three sports growing up. Uh, my primary sport was basketball. Um, that was the one I had the most success in and one I was best at. Next was baseball. Um, couldn't hit, so I had to quit. That was not, that didn't go very well. And then lastly, this might surprise uh, some of the youth knowing how much they know that I disdain running. Uh, soccer was my other sport. <laughs> That's what I did. And within each of these sports, there's a set of rules that, uh, per, that we have to adhere to in order to keep the game fair and that the expectations are all on the same plane so that people can just go and play. And this is a huge part of what uh, the Ten Commandments are all about. It's to give us these guiding principles, these, I, these basic ideas of what it means to be in a relationship with God, in a covenant with Him, and, and so that we could know Him and so that we can please Him and we can honor Him who is the expert in His Word. And I'm simply holding it up as a mirror as a standard for all of us to adhere to, including myself. And so when you hear that, he, so when you hear some of those things, know that that is where it's coming from. So let's begin. I'm going to actually ask you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. That's where we're going to spend a lot of our time. If you need a, one of these Bibles, these brown hardcover Bibles in the seat in front of you, it's on page 1177. So I invite you to turn there. Um, and while you're turning there, we're going to just go ahead and get the fifth commandment on to the screen and just read and, and I'll read it for us. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. The word honor here is this word chaved. Try and say that five times fast with that little ch part. That's a little difficult. And what this means is this kind of weightiness, this like importance, significance. And so to view like our parents with reverence and honor and respect, this is a huge part of what honoring our parents is all about. It's to make them weighty in our eyes, that we would see them in a very important way in our lives. And, and the Israelites saw this in two different ways, how this applied in particular. First of all, it was a financial thing. So this is actually our, print, our first principle that we'll look at this morning is honor your parents financially to care for them as they age. Okay, and this, and where this comes out is as your parents age, it's important to continue to show them dignity and honor and respect, even if you've kind of gotten to a point where you're now more like the parent, um, having to take care of your parent, there is still some dignity and respect that you can give them in a relationship with them. Part of that is to make sure that their needs are taken care of. So that can be in some ways taking them, putting them into a retirement home so that their, you know, at least medical needs are more, um, are met in a better manner than trying to, you know, keep them at your house house, or if money runs out to find a way to care for them or, or in, you know, have them live with you or something, something along those lines to make sure that they are taken care, care of. In that culture, they would actually just have, you know, everybody lived in that house, like everybody in the family. And so grandparents would be living there, parents, the kids, everybody's in the house. And so that's one of the things. So we, let's look at Mark 7 where we kind of get this idea, it's going to be on the screen. We're going to read a conversation that Jesus has with the Pharisees. We start in verse 9, and he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you, may, you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. What we see in this passage is Jesus is critiquing this idea that the Pharisees had, that they could create these man-made traditions that could be on an equal like plane of authority with the word of God, with the Bible. That's, and let me just tell you, right off the bat, that's a big no-no. Don't do that. Okay? Don't make up traditions and then put them on an, equ an equal plane with the commands of God. So basically what they were saying was, you can, you know, that money that you were, or that financial part of your life that you were going to devote to caring for your parents when they reached a certain age, you can actually give that to God instead, and that would be honoring God. And Jesus is saying, you're actually nullifying the command of God. You're, you're, 
You're striking it from the record. You're taking it away. You're not doing the thing that I'm actually wanting you to do. And so, but what we see from this is there's this principle that they would care for their families. And so that's to provide for them financially, to take care of them, so to honor them. And as well, not just that, but like when they are, when your parents are aging, to give them a relationship. You know, spend time with them. You know, that's one of the biggest needs of people that are, that are reaching that stage of life is just relationship and care. And so even if mental capacity isn't quite where it used to be, still jump in and build a relationship as best as you possibly can so that they will know that you care about them. And then some of this has to even do with do, being willing to do the dirty work of caregiving, doing some of the lesser um, glamorous jobs of taking care of people. And so that's, how, that's one way they would look at it. The second way was in terms of obedience. So this is our second principle. Honor your parents relationally in obedience and respect. And the whole idea around honor, as, as we'll see from even Paul's passages, is about this idea of obedience, submitting to authority. And so to obey and, and to submit to our parents gives a very good, uh, does, gives a good indication of our willingness to submit to our relationship with God. If we're not willing to submit to our parents and obey our parents and honor them, how are we supposed to then honor and obey God? Because the way this works out is when you are born into a family, your parents are your representatives to God. This became so clear to me when I became a parent for the first time. And our, our little Avery, she's turning one years old next Sunday, which is exciting. You know, big birthday party coming up, you know, all that. And... This made sense to me because what we would, what we do, uh, because Avery gets up at like 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, um, and I'm the kind of guy that gets up at the crack of noon. Uh, I, I am a, I am a late, late riser. I, I would, that, that's the way I would like to live. That's not how I live, by the way. I'm not that lazy. Uh, but we let her come into bed with us so we can slowly kind of wake up to the day and she's alert. She's ready to roll. So she's just kind of crawling all over us. And uh, early on when she did that, I mean, she truly wanted, if she saw something on the ground from our bed, she wanted to take a nosedive and just go right after it. And we, being good parents, just totally let her just fall fat, you know, fat, flat on her face on the ground. It, no, we didn't do that. That's bad parenting. We held her back, we restrained her, we protected her, and we were teaching her that distance fall means ouch. Okay? <laughs> like, that's not a good idea. So we restrained her, we protected her, but we're also trying to train her up and teach her that what mom and dad says goes. Oh, mom and dad says, goes, we are in charge. And you have to see how serious the Israelites took this idea. When we look at Exodus 21, 17, it says that if anyone curses their father or mother, they are to be put to death. That is serious. Punishable by death. I, I, you know, my parents are here, so I'm sorry. Um, thank you for not enacting this at any point. <laughs> I'm still alive. Um, because, I mean, that, but that's how serious they took it. And here's why they took it so seriously. Because in Israel, with the Ten Commandments, the whole idea is about worshiping no other God but Him. Having no other gods before Him. That's kind of the guiding idea of the whole Ten Commandments. And so Israel was supposed to be this place. And so as parents being the representatives of God, we would lose, the people would lose sight of what it means to be the people of God if they didn't know what it means to honor their parents. That's why they took this so seriously. But we see what happens with Israel when they stop taking this seriously. Because a huge part actually of being, you know, this, of this commandment is actually not just like honoring in terms of obedience, but on the parents to be the ones who say, no, I'm the one who's in charge and you listen to what I have to say. I'm God's representative to you and you, you will follow my rules and you will obey or there will be consequences. That's good parenting, good healthy parenting to give consequences and boundaries. But what happened to Israel is they forgot this. They forgot that this is what they were supposed to do. And eventually, this it's so sad. When you, if you read the whole Bible through, you see, you get to 2 Kings, you see that in the time of King Josiah, they actually lose the law. 
they lose it. They lost, they couldn't find it. It got misplaced. And in the time of King Josiah, they find it. It shows up and then they read it to King Josiah. It was like the first time he had ever heard it in his life and he wept knowing that his nation had di- drifted so far from God that it was too late. And God had even said to him, sorry, it's too late. You have been faithful. And so jo- Josiah tried to create a whole revival, tried to bring the nation back and but God told him, it's too late. It's just too late. You, you have done this, so I'm going to wait to do this till you know, wait to carry out what I'm going to do, which was, he was going to take the nation into exile. I'm going to wait until your son's time. I'm not going to have you see it. But still, what we see is this whole idea is they forgot their whole purpose as a nation was to continue this on. And this is where the part of the promise comes out when we look at Exodus 20.12. So that you may dwell in the land. You may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. We can look at that promise and that can be confusing. That can be this kind of idea that somebody might have that like, okay, if I honor my father and mother... That means guarantee 100% that I'm going to live a long life. If it, it, it only takes us just a few minutes to think about the realities of what can happen in real life to know that that's not what happens. You can have some really obedient children who honor their parents and do some and be really sweet, great children that don't live a long life. This is, but what this is, this is actually a covenantal promise by God to the nation of Israel. If you seek to honor your father and mother, and by extension, you are honoring me, you will have a long, your country is going to last for a long time. And so this is actually our, print, our third principle that we'll look at this morning is honoring your parents leads to an enjoyment of the life that God has given you. Like I said, this, this, this idea can be misunderstood, but what really is going on here, we'll see this even in Paul, is that when we honor our parents, we can live a life that is truly full of joy and we enjoy things. I, I, I've noticed this in my own life. When I'm living a life where I am in honoring God, honoring the authority that's around me and, and trusting in God and close in my relationship with God, life is just better. It doesn't mean that it's perfect. It doesn't mean that it's without trouble. It doesn't mean it's without issues that come up and heartaches. But at least there's a sense of peace and contentment and joy that I cannot find if I'm walking the other direction and not honoring God and not honoring the commands that he has put on my life. When you walk in this direction, if you're walking away from God, we all know it. This is self-evident that this is not working and we are not enjoying life. We have been designed by God to enjoy the life that we have been given by God. And again, it's not an absolute guarantee. But this whole thing was truly to be a continual instruction uh, from the parents to teach their children what it means to be part of the people of God, to honor him, to know him, to love him. And so Paul uses this passage uh, to teach even further uh, the New Testament church about this. So go ahead and look down in Ephesians 6, where I had you turn earlier. We're going to look at that real quick. Starting in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Now look at, look at how Paul says this. I mean, first of all, he directs it straight to children. So teenagers, kids, even college age, this is for you. Okay, and I'm sure this is some parent's favorite verse in the Bible. Okay, <laughs> honor your father and mother, okay? Uh, but he says, look, he said, to obey your parents for this is right. This is the way that it's supposed to be. And so here's where we, what we see, our, our fourth principle, is that honoring your parents pleases the Lord. When we actually look at another passage, I'll give you a minute to write that down, but when we look at another passage from Paul in Colossians 3.20, he says that children obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Notice what he says. Obey your parents, not in some things, not in really the only most important things, but the little things you can kind of ignore. He says in everything obey your parents. Now, for those of us who are deep thinkers, 
there could be at least two questions. I'm going to cover two questions that pop up. Two what-if questions. First of all, what if my parents are not Christians and I am? What do I do? How do I honor them then? How do I obey them then? I have a friend that I contacted this week from high school who grew up in a home that her parents grew up in church, um, but they got really deeply wounded by the church, by churches. And so they really didn't want to, do, uh, really want to go to church growing up. They had some sort of idea of faith in Christ or when she was growing up. But when she got into high school and she became friends with somebody that I went to church with, she fell in love with Jesus, gave her life to Jesus, and she started to come to youth group. And then what ended up happening is there was this tension that happened between her and her parents that it, it was almost like church and her, friend, her Christian friends became more important to her than her family. And that hurt their feelings, that, 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 uh, that bothered them. And my friend said that she, felt, she fe still feels a lot of regret about it because of the fact that she would even go to the point of like disobeying even some of the tedious rules, like their curfew, and use it as an excuse. Oh, well, I was with my Christian friends. You know, we weren't doing anything wrong, but she wasn't obeying their rules. And she said, she said to me that she regrets that because it negatively, re negatively reflected upon Jesus and uh, upon the church and upon her, her relationship with Christ how important this was. And so she regretted that, even though, you know, her parents were noticing differences about her and, and God was doing some really cool things in her life. She did mention some regret over the fact that, you know, I wish I had obeyed even the most ridiculous, the, the most tedious rules um, so that I could show my parents how important my relationship with Christ really was. And so, so there are two pieces, two important pieces to mention, uh, kind of to apply that kind of an idea. Is first to not be afraid to share with your parents in, in a really honest and, and vulnerable kind of way why you are so devoted to Christ. What is so important to you about Jesus and why this is so important for you to be devoting so much time to you. But then to obey your parents, even your non-Christian parents, in everything because that reflects Christ to them. That gives them an opportunity to see that you truly are being different, that God has done a work in you that is something completely different because normal teenagers don't obey to that level, apparently. I don't know that yet. I'll get there someday. Here's the other one. And here's the other what if question. And this one is, uh, I wish I could spend a whole sermon slot to talk about this, but it's, we only have a few minutes. What if the parents are abusive? What do you do then? And I talked to my mom about this this week. Um, my mom is one of the most courageous people I've ever met. And, um, okay, I can't look at her because I'm going to cry. Um, <laughs> My mom grew up in an abusive home, and she at one point decided, after she had really given her life to Christ and God had changed her heart, she decided, you know what, I'm going to start honoring and obeying my abusive father in a way that was totally contrary to what, um, you know, was normal. And she, so she did. So, and it, it was obedience in terms of like, you know, the rules of the house, or if he was uncomfortable with her taking a certain job or going to a certain place, he would, she would say, he would say no, and she'd stay. And so what she did is, is by doing that, it eventually changed his perspective and changed his heart towards her so that she said, you know what? Or that he started to say, you know what? I need to change. I need to stop. But also, this is something we need to understand about these kind of things. If that is happening in a home, we, you need to get the police involved because a crime is being committed. But that does not mean that you can't show them miraculous respect and honor through the grace of God by showing them love and mercy and forgiveness by the grace of God because that's only how that would happen. Somehow. But still, let me make sure, I, I want to make sure I say that very clearly. If that is happening in a home, it must be reported to the authorities because there are bigger issues at play with the abuser that need to be addressed than just that. But that
that is still an example of the level of what God can do in a person's life simply by obeying and honoring the heart of God and honoring a parent who truly did not deserve it. And by the time uh, my grandpa passed away, he had a very tender heart. He was a goofy, funny kind of guy. And God did a lot of work in his life and a lot of work in um, my mom's life in particular. And so make sure, do not let that pattern of abuse continue. Report it. Try and get some help because that, that is not a healthy place to be. And so I want to, one more, we have one more principle we're going to go over this morning. Principle number five, which is honor God by teaching your children to follow Christ. Look at Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Look at what that says. Do not exasperate your children. What does that mean to exasperate? Well, that could be in any way in, in our parenting to... Uh, where they, they build up some sort of anger and frustration and uh, resentment towards us or even to the level of outward ho outright hostility towards us, or towards us because of the way that we are treating them. And so these are some things like showing favoritism between kids. Like if we make it pretty obvious that one kid is our favorite but another one isn't, that can exasperate that kid that isn't the favorite. That can be withholding encouragement and being overly critical. You have to balance. You have to balance with critiquing and showing encouragement. Using love as manipulation for their behavior. That you're only going to love them if they act like good boys and girls. It's the only way. We're playing the comparison game. But I, and I think this last one is, is huge for our culture, is pushing achievement over character. Where we push and push and push for them to achieve great things. And it's not necessarily bad for wa wanting them to achieve great things. But to push them to the point that oh, that's what we're really driving them towards instead of having godly character. Because let me tell you what's... Our primary job, and again, remember what I said at the beginning, mirror in my face, talking to me too. Our primary job as parents is to raise up, as Christian parents, is to raise up our kids to be disciples of Jesus. It's not to make them superstars in sports. It's not to make them successful businessmen or women. It's not to get them into a four-year college so that they can make a lot of money in this culture. It's not to make them the next great politician or to be perfect model citizens. That's not our primary job. Those things are not bad in of themselves. We should be striving to do the best that we can with what God has given us. But our primary job should be to disciple them, to teach them and instruct them in the Lord so that they can become disciples of Christ who will carry on that legacy to their own children. That is our number one job. And there's nothing that's more important. And when we look at this, Paul is being, being very clear that it's the parent's job. We don't get to abdicate to other people. We don't get to say, okay, we dropped them off for Sunday school. Hopefully this works. Hopefully this sticks. Stick them into Sunday school. Take them to youth group. Take them to anything, a Christian club. You know, let, leave it to the pastors. Leave it to their youth group leaders, their small group leaders, their Sunday school teachers. Let them take care of it. No, it's our job. We are the primary disciples. We are the ones who will teach our kids. Because here's the, uh, the scary, very scary reality. If we don't do that, the world will find a way to fill that void of teaching and instruction. Because the question is not what, or it, it, if we are going to be disciples, but what we are going to be disciples of. Everyone is a disciple of someone or something. It's just a matter of what that is. And so where we are silent, the world will be loud enough to fill that void. And where we don't lead, our children will find someone else to follow. And where we don't teach, your children will, our children will learn from the culture and pick it up from there. And so this is our, it is our absolute necessity as parents to teach our kids to follow Christ in word and in deed, in everything that they do. But I want to address two final things before I close when it comes to this. First of all, you don't have to be perfect. 
You don't have to have all of the answers. The beauty of the gospel is that God gives you his Holy Spirit to enable you to do the things that he has called you to do. And so, parents, we are not alone. There is a God who loves us enough that he has put his Holy Spirit in us so that we can do the job that he has called us to do. You don't need to be, have all the answers. What you need to do is just to come before God and say, God, I want to be your disciple. I want to be a follower of you so that I can teach my kids to follow you. So I can show them what it means. God, I don't know what it means. Help me learn it. That's what we do. We come before him and we say, God, help me to learn this so that I can do it. And then secondly, if you look back on your life and, and, and maybe your kids are grown, and you look back and you, there, there's a lot more regret than there is rejoicing, let me just give you a little bit of hope. Because of how amazing and incredible and powerful God is and what he can do, the story's not over. God is not finished with these stories yet. God can do a miraculous work in those kids' lives. So if you look back, you can start to say, you know what? God, I didn't do this right. God, forgive me. Help me to do it right from here on. God, help me to be the kind of person that you've called me to be. And here's the thing is we are not doomed and stuck to repeat these kind of patterns because what God will do, again, is that Holy Spirit comes in us when we give our lives to Christ and enables us to live in that way so that we can be the people he wants us to be. And so truly, how we are forever children is by submitting ourselves to God, submitting to his authority in our lives, and then submitting to the authorities that are uh, directly in front of us, whether that's a parent, whether that's a boss, whether that's um, a coach, something along those lines, a teacher. We submit to those authorities, and we say, God, help me. Help me to be the person you've called me to be. So again... If you feel like you, if you have that guilt feeling that you have messed that up, take heart this morning that God can enable you and is available for you to be able to do what you need to do to be the kind of parent he's called you to do. You have not been abandoned to figure this out on your own. God is with you to give you all the help that you need. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this morning. I'm so thankful for your word and thankful for it speaking to us and opening up our hearts and exposing us to be the people uh, so that you, you can enable us to be the people you want us to be. And so, God, I pray this morning that um, for all of us that are parents in this room, God, that we would commit ourselves to be the primary disciplers in our homes, teaching our kids what it means to follow you and to be in a right relationship with you. And so, God, we just, uh, we thank you for this and we pray this in your name. Amen.